Good morning. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, my name is Marcus Ragland. I'm one of the ministers on staff. Uh, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you all and to open uh, God's word. Uh, whether you're here in the room or if you're watching uh, online, we're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, growing up for me, uh, I remember my mom used to play this gospel song by a guy named Donnie McClurkin. And it was called Speak to My Heart. There's a line that gets repeated uh, near the end of it. It says, speak to my heart, Lord, give me your holy word. If I can hear from you, then I'll know what to do. I won't go alone. And I remember every time I heard that song, it would always kind of stir this question in me of, uh, what does it sound like for God to speak to you? How, does, how do you know it's his voice? How do you know it's not somebody else's voice, right? Uh, even as a kid, I remember desiring uh, for God to speak to me uh, in a special way, to know what he sounds like in various moments. And then over time, I learned that it sounded something like James Earl Jones. Um, but seriously, maybe, maybe you've had a, a similar desire like that, right? Like you've, uh, maybe you're not sure where you are with God or where God uh, is with you in the room, but you can recall moments of desperation where you prayed and asked that God would speak and would move in some way in your life. And you anticipated and were expecting and were longing to hear his voice. Uh, this morning, we are in the midst of a series, it's the third week, uh, that we've called Friend of Sinners. And our hope in the series is to do just that, to learn how we discern to hear God's voice. Um, as we look through various encounters that Jesus has with uh, folks in the Bible, we get to uh, see ourselves in the story and we also get to hear his voice. Maybe we never heard an audible voice uh, from the sky of God, uh, but out of his kindness and his desire to make himself known to us, he has preserved his words in the scriptures and we can look to them to know what he sounds like. And that's good news for us because uh, we want to hear his voice in all kinds of scenarios, right? What does the voice of Jesus sound like to those who are hurting? What does his voice sound like? What are his words to those who feel hopeless and countless other things? Last week, we got to hear what Jesus sounds like when he's with the anxious or the distracted. And this morning, we get to uh, look and listen to see what he sounds like um, and what his words are like to the outcast, to someone who feels like for more reason than one, they've been rejected by others. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to John chapter 4, and we'll make our way through there. But before we do, I just want to briefly invite us to prepare our hearts um, and just to offer a quick prayer that we might hear from God. Jesus, we want to hear from you. So Lord, would you help us to see ourselves in, your, in this story, in your scriptures, and would you help us to hear your voice? as you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting at verse 1 to verse 4, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Our story finds Jesus not in a room, but on a journey. Uh, word is getting around in Judea uh, that Jesus is baptizing more people than John the Baptist, which means uh, the Pharisees are starting to take notice, right? The religious elite um, are starting to uh, see and raise alarm and probably some scrutiny around his ministry. And so for whatever reason, Jesus decides it's time for him and his disciples to make their way from Judea to Galilee. Now, there's three routes to get from Judea to Galilee. Uh, there's a highway west along the Mediterranean Sea. There's one east along the Jordan River. And then there's a path directly through the middle, straight through Samaria. Uh, to give you some perspective, if you were in Dallas and you wanted to get to McKinney, taking either of the east or west path would be like going from Dallas to Grapevine and then from Grapevine to McKinney. Uh, taking 75 north, the straight route would be going through Samaria. Uh, if you were a Jew, you'd always go the grapevine route because Jews hated Samaritans. Uh, when the northern kingdom of Israel was sacked by the Assyrians, uh, some of the Israelites began to enter uh, marry and mingle uh, with the Assyrians, and they became what was known as the Samarian people, and Jews saw them as traitors. They hated them for it. 
And over time, that continued to persist all the way into Jesus' day to be a great disdain. It was a, it was a kind of hatred and racism that just became the air that they breathed. Taking the grapevine route uh, at this point probably wasn't even a conscious act of hatred. It was just the way you, you went north. The disciples would have known this. It was something they probably didn't question themselves. So when Jesus told them that they were getting ready to make their way to Galilee, they would have been like, okay, so are we going to go east or west? I know this really great re- restaurant if we go to the west. Um, but Jesus doesn't want to go west or to the east. He wants to go straight through. Jesus knows why they're asking, but Jesus doesn't want to take that route. Uh, he's going through Samaria. In fact, the text says in verse 4, he had to travel through Samaria. Jesus says something like, I know that's the way most people go, but not for us. I must go through Samaria. Will you come with me? The disciples have a decision to make now. Do we follow Jesus through Samaria, or do we take some other route or stay here, do what's comfortable and safe? Because life with Jesus is always a constant invitation to deeper intimacy and obedience. So they decide to go with him, not because they're comfortable with all of the decisions, but because they love him and trust him. They take the short route because it's also the way that he's going, but it's also a rocky route. It's hard. Um, And they they get through. They're just outside of Samaria in a suburb called Sakar uh, at the foot of Mount Gerizim. From Dallas to McKinney, they're at about Allen. Um, And if you were a Jew and you heard mention of this place, you'd likely uh, think of a place, um, you'd likely be thinking of the patriarch Jacob, right? This was a a special place to the people. If you were a Samaritan, maybe you're thinking um, of this is where God meets with man and a host of other beliefs that would have comprised uh, the Samaritan worldview. And this is where Jesus decides to take a break and set up camp. Jesus was tired from his journey. Uh, He was thirsty. As the text showed, he was hungry. We know this because he sends the disciples to get food. So he hungers, he thirsts, just like we do. He turns to the disciples, tells them to go. They go into town to get food for them to prepare. And while they're gone, Jesus walks over to Jacob's well so that he could get a drink. But he has no bucket. He doesn't have a cup, nothing you need to get water from a well. And then up walks a woman from Samaria to draw water. It's just her and Jesus there alone. And she's surprised to see anybody there. It's midday, the text says. Um, That means it's hot, hot outside. Uh, No one normally goes to draw water during this time of day. You would either go early in the morning uh, before the sun came up or you'd go later in the day when the sun went down, when it was cooler. Uh, But she's going in the middle of the day in the unbearable heat. The fact that she's drawing water alone at this time of day Uh, is just as odd as her finding a Jewish man sitting alone with her in the middle of the day. Uh, We don't know her name, uh, but we know that she has a complex past, and it's likely the reason that she's drawing water at this time of day. Um, So she proceeds to draw water, her eyes averted, she's trying to play unnoticeable, and Jesus breaks the silence. Uh, Excuse me, can you draw me some water for me to drink? And she's thinking, why on earth is he talking to me? The woman doesn't know whose company she's in, but maybe hearing his accent or uh, noticing his facial features or the brand of sandals he has on, she knows he's a Jew. And because of that, she can safely assume a few things about him. Like the disciples, she would have been aware of the hatred and the discord between the people. And so she replies in verse 9, how is it that you, a Jew, Asked for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Another way to uh, translate that last part is Jews will have nothing in common with Samaritans. There's no, uh, for the Jews, there's no fellowshipping with Samaritans, no breaking of bread, no sharing a cup. Sharing a cup with a Samaritan would mean that they would be made unclean. And for a Jew to be unclean means that you are unfit for the presence of God and a host of other social privileges at the time. Several things could make a person unclean, disease, eating certain foods, touching a carcass, etc. And so you would avoid being unclean at all costs. And Samaritans and everything they touched to the Jews would be avoided at all costs. It's the reason you go the grapevine route in the first place. Meanwhile, the disciples, imagine them in town, surrounded by Samaritans, touching things that Samaritans touch, buying food from them. 
The Samaritans would likely be just as confused as them, like, why are you at my bakery asking for bread? Seriously? They're still wondering, why is Jesus making us go this route? I really wanted to go to that restaurant to the west. Um, They're in this town. They're like, doesn't he know this is all going to make us unclean? Like, what is he doing? To be clear, none of these dynamics are lost on Jesus. He knows exactly where he is. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's not deterred by any of it. He doesn't feed into the animosity of the moment, but rather he smiles and he replies to her, if you knew the gift of God and who asked you for a drink, you'd ask him and he'd give you living water. Jesus sees her and he's not thinking about himself becoming unclean, but rather he's thinking about why he came to the earth in the first place. Maybe he's even uh, thinking about Ezekiel 36, where God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow all of my statutes and observe my ordinances. Far from worrying about her making him unclean by sharing a cup, Jesus wanted to offer her true cleansing. The greatest invitation of belonging anybody could ever hope for. Think about it. What could be more intimate and speak a better word of belonging than for the Spirit of God himself to take his residence within you, your own body becoming a dwelling place in which the divine is pleased to dwell. But she doesn't know whose company she's in, and rather than hearing his gracious invitation, she hears the condescending words of all those who demeaned her in the past. Her heart's still hard towards him. Look at verse 11. The woman said to him, sir, You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well, and he drank from it himself, as did his his sons and their livestock. She's confused, maybe even a little bit insulted. So let me get this straight. You just asked me for water. Now all of a sudden you've got living water to offer me? It's not enough that you're too good to share a cup with me, but now you insult my water supply? Are you greater than Jacob? Isn't he one of your patriarchs? He's the one who gave us this. He drank from it, and so did his sons and their flocks long before this was Samaritan territory. She's got that response on the hip. This isn't her first dispute with Jews about the well. That well's been there for a long time. Likely, maybe that was a conversation around dinner tables all the time. They've heard this story and talked about the disputes between the Samaritans and the Jews for generations. She's waiting for his response. She already knows what he's going to say. He's going to sound just like all the other Jews that they've ever disputed about this with. But Jesus is calm. Again, he doesn't feed into the animosity of the moment. He considers her statement, and then he gently responds in verse 13. Everyone who drinks from this water supply will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I give them will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Rebecca McLaughlin in her book, Jesus Through the Eyes of Women, sheds light on this moment in the text. As we look through the Samaritan woman's eyes in this moment, we see Jesus as a Jewish man trampling on the ethnic and social barriers of his day. Perhaps she wonders why, what he's really after, but Jesus isn't there for what he can take. He's there for what he can give. She still doesn't know whose company she's in, but she's intrigued. Her defenses are starting to come down a bit. She's considering what Jesus is offering. This isn't going the way that she thought it would, but an infinite water supply sounds pretty good. That means no more lonely visits in the middle of the heat to this place. Remember, there's a reason she doesn't go to the well when everyone else does. Uh, She wanted to be there alone. That was part of the plan. And the prospects of not having to do that anymore was enticing. She's like, I don't know who this man is. I don't know where he's getting his living water from. But if it can keep me from having to come here over and over again, I'll take it. So she responds, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come to get water anymore. Jesus' facial expression changes. Less levity, but not unkind, like when you're about to tell a friend difficult news. Jesus wants her to better understand his invitation, so he reveals to her that he knows why she comes to the well alone. Very well. Go get your husband and come back. His tone is patient. 
He's being a gentleman by inviting her husband to be a part of this conversation in exchange, but he knows it's more complicated than that. Jesus is beginning to step into the middle of her pain. She hears the word husband and the heat feels hotter. She's sweating. Jesus' tone was gentle, but the words reverberate loudly in her mind. She's wondering, why is he asking about my husband? How does he know? Did word reach Judea already? She responds quickly and direct, I don't have a husband. That reply too, she keeps on the hip. Easy way to keep from going to a place she doesn't want to go. But that's exactly where Jesus wants to go. Because life with Jesus is always a constant invitation to deeper intimacy and obedience. Jesus responds with grief in his voice. You, you've correctly said, I don't have a husband. You have, you've had five husbands. And the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Biblical imagination here. I read this. I imagine she's a bit confused, feeling really vulnerable. The stranger has just disclosed a very tender part of her story. She's trying to maintain some projected poise. Um, and Jesus continues, Elam, he was your first husband. You loved him. You were faithful to him. You were so excited to be married, but he wasn't a good husband. He was unkind to you. Eventually, he divorced you. Then you remarried Caleb. He had a hard time getting over your previous marriage. You had a hard time comparing him to your previous husband. That marriage ended, and then he goes to the third. Maybe that was mostly his fault. It ends. Then he goes to the fourth. Maybe that's mostly her fault. It ends. She's wondering, how does he know that? He doesn't just know about the divorces. He, he's naming names. He knows what happened. Has he met them before? At what point did the talk of the town spread? It got to Judea. It came back to this guy. Like, what's, what's happening? Are people now speaking of her, of the, the woman who can't make marriage work? Because of that, she situated her life in such a way to never have to face this part of her story again. It's part of the reason she comes to the well alone. In fact, after the conversation with her parents and her friends about the fourth failed marriage, she just said, no more. Just going to leave it in the past. We don't know all of the details for sure, but Jesus did. And Jesus retells her her whole story, not to build up her shame, but to begin healing it. But in her mind, it's happening again. She's alone at the well with a man who reminds her of all the reasons that she already feels alone and outcast. In her mind, her ethnicity accuses her, her gender accuses her, her past accuses her, and now this man is just highlighting all of that. I see myself here. Um, I don't know about you, um, but I know what it's like to have failed more than five times and in more than one ways. Um, I don't know what it's like to be a Samaritan woman, but I know what it's like to, be, to feel unwanted because of the color of my skin. I see my sin in her. I see shame. I see regrets. And could you imagine having all of that laid bare before you in the presence of a stranger? how vulnerable you'd feel. That's terrifying in the, in the company of a stranger, probably even with a friend. But Jesus is, in fact, not just a stranger. Um, he's a merciful God. And the best thing that could ever happen to her, the best thing that could happen to any one of us is for all of our lives to be laid bare before a merciful God so that he could mend the things that are broken. But she doesn't know whose company she's in yet. She doesn't understand what he's offering. This is really uncomfortable, so she tries to change the subject. The woman responds, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. She's like, I know how to get out of this, Mr. Prophet. Let's have a theological debate. I know your type loves those. Maybe that can get the conversation uh, more around some of that stuff and less my personal business. Do you see yourself in that? You ever done that? Students at Unite, maybe some of us in Bible class, home group, questions come around, we lean into the intellectual part of it so we don't have to make it personal. So what's something God's been calling you to repent from? To Marcus, any thoughts? Oh, you, uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. Actually, I've been reading this really good book on repentance. Uh, it's by Dr. A.B. Alphabet. It's really wonderful. He's got these like three different kinds of repentances that you can 
right? Why do we do that? It's because it's a lot easier to talk about repentance than it is to repent. It's a lot easier to talk about our addictions in theory than it is to actually confess them. It's a lot easier to talk about dying to self. It's really hard to actually die to self. It's easier to talk about theology in principle. It's hard to make it personal. And I see myself in that. Man, this, this actually hit me like a ton of bricks this week. Um, just thinking, right, she doesn't know whose presence she's in, but many of us, we do know him, and we can still keep him at arm's length to certain areas of our lives, as if we didn't know who he was. We're too easily satisfied talking about being made whole than we are actually doing the thing that allows us to be made whole. We treat Jesus, as, as Jamin said once, not, uh, we don't treat him like he's lord of the home. We treat him like he's guest of the home. So we sidestep. We distract. We numb. Avoid the difficult, raw conversation with God. And rather than drawing near and allowing him to do his work, we deflect. Hear me. Numbing pain is nominal peace compared to the surpassing healing power that comes from receiving the living water that Jesus has to offer us when he gives us his very self. Jesus wants more for her than nominal peace. He wants more from us than nominal peace. He wants to make us whole. So he leans into her question while still inviting her in deeper. He looks up at the mountain, looks back at her. She knows what's gonna happen. She's like, he's gonna disagree with my view. That's all fine, as long as we can get this away from my shame. But Jesus speaks, woman, believe me, To address her this way would be the equivalent of saying, ma'am, I tell you the truth. Jesus knows the question is not of chief concern, but he's gracious and he's patient. He knows that it's a question she's genuinely concerned about one way or another, so he gives her the, the honest answer. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. The Mount Gerizim next to them was to the Samaritans what Mount Zion was to the Jews. The Jews believed Mount Zion was, and it was in fact, where God met with his people. Samaritan believed it was Mount Gerizim. As a Samaritan, she would have had an off-base theological view. It was a mix, some mixture of what the Bible teaches about God and what the Assyrians believed about their gods. And Jesus wanted to correct that. This is what he means by we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. The revelation concerning God was given to the Jew first that they might be a light to the world to put on full display what God is like and what he's doing in the world. All of this, the woman likely anticipated. You think I'm wrong. The Jews are right. Yada, yada, yada. Can we get on with it so I can get my water and be on my way and get out of the Texas heat? But Jesus turns a corner she likely does not expect. He goes on, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This is new information for her. Maybe she hears true worshiper and automatically assumes he's speaking of the Jews, because why would he be speaking about her if she's worshiping on the Rome mountain? But Jesus is speaking of an hour to come, and any time that happens in the Gospels, it's always a signal pointing to the cross. But here he says something interesting. Uh, An hour is coming and is now here. Something is yet to come, but something is happening now, even here with her. An hour is coming when worship will not be restricted to a mountain or to an ethnic group or to any human barrier or boundary, but rather true worship will be in response to the work of the Spirit in someone's life. And that will come out of them as praise and obedience to the one true God. True worshipers not only know truths about God, but they will walk through life with God. And life with Jesus will erupt out of their hearts in gratitude, obedience, and praise. And some rendition of that was beginning to happen here with her. Maybe she's confused. Maybe she's intrigued. Maybe it's a mix of both. What is he talking about with the spirit stuff again? I imagine either way, she's still trying to wrap up the conversation and be on her way. Besides whatever kind of worship the father's looking for, 
she doesn't see that she's one of them yet. Plus, she starts to notice that the disciples are coming from afar. Great, there's more of them. Time to go. So she replies as she's preparing her things to leave. Uh, That's wonderful. Sounds great. I know the Messiah is coming, and when he gets here, he'll explain all things. Until then, we may never know. Have a nice day. And Jesus quickly responds as to stop her in her tracks. I am he. He communicates so much in what he does not say. He doesn't say, I am he only for Jewish men. He doesn't say, I am he only for those who've never been divorced. He doesn't say, I am he for those who can come to the well when everyone else comes to the well. He just says, I am. And somehow she knows what that means, and she makes a connection, because in verse 28 it says, Then the woman left her jar, went into town, and told the people. That living water Jesus was talking about before softens her heart, opens her eyes. She's now in awe because she finally realizes whose company she's been in this whole time. She thinks to herself, is it really him? And I imagine Jesus does that thing that he does where he reads people's thoughts and responds, and he's like, yes, I'm really him. She drops her bucket. She leaves everything, runs back to town. Jesus is full of joy. I imagine she's thinking as she runs, my goodness, I just met the Messiah, (laughs) the Messiah. I was so rude and standoffish to him at first. (laughs) But he was kind and he was gentle. He was with me. And he wasn't ashamed to be with me alone. When his, when his guys came, he didn't, his demeanor didn't change. I, I never even gave him a drink of water. I can't wait to tell all the people in the town, right? She's just, she's ruminating over the things that just happened, replaying the conversation, realizing that he's much kinder than she had anticipated. She doesn't wait with a full heart. She runs and tells. There's even a little bit of unknown in her delivery when she gets there. Look at verse 29. She gets there, and this is, this is her message to the town. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. So she gets to town. Maybe there's a group of women, and they're murmuring about why she goes to the well alone. Maybe she runs into a, one of her old ex-husbands. Maybe she runs into one of their new wives. Who knows? A bunch of people are there, and she just starts telling any and everybody that she can about this encounter she just had. Y'all have to come with me to the well. I think I just met the Messiah. At first, they're skeptical. Like, how could you be sure? How do you, how do you know? And she's like, well, I've never met this man before. It's a Jewish guy. I think he's just stopping in town. And he just started recounting all these things in my life. And she begins to start to retell the shameful story that she always wanted to hide to highlight the gracious goodness of our God. And hear me. Delivery matters. But an imperfect delivery about a perfect God is more than capable of changing lives. It wasn't the best pitch, but she was faithful to tell and God was faithful to pour out his spirit. And whatever she said, all of the people from the town left and they went to see Jesus. And notice what she says. She doesn't say, come meet this man so he could put all of you in your place for what you did to me. It's not all on them. There's ownership. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Jesus cares about her suffering and our suffering, and we'll see more about that next week. And part of caring about all of our suffering is dealing with every part of our lives. That means our suffering, our sin, our shame, and everything in between, which can be hard to see and hard to deal with uh, when we suffered under the sins of others. But look at how radically Jesus changed her life. He's no longer just Messiah in theory in her mind. He is her Messiah. And for every part of her, Jesus quite literally took her pain and her shame, and in its place, he gave her joy. And that was his goal the whole time. Not just to tell her, but to show her that she is, in fact, the kind of worshiper that the Father seeks. Jesus presses into the most painful 
parts of her heart, not to destroy it, but that he might take up dwelling there. She becomes a living temple in whom the Godhead is pleased to take up residence. Though rejected by man, she's accepted by God, and more than accepted, she's wanted. Once an outcast, now a welcome daughter. But that cost her something, friends. It meant she had to be in a place that she loathed being, in company that she did not want, talking about things that she did not want to bring up, all so that she could receive from God the true gift of life that nobody can live without. And listen, all of that is possible for her and for us because there was an hour coming when Jesus himself would pay a cost that was much costlier. He would be in a place that he loathed being in, surrounded by company who didn't want him, spewing and saying all kinds of things about him that were not true, all while he's breathing his last breath so that he might give to all who believe something that no one can live without. This Samaritan's woman, immediate response to that love, that mercy, that grace, don't miss this, the immediate response was to run towards people who had marginalized her, a source of her shame, also that she could tell them about this man who changed her life. She didn't need to take a class first. She didn't wait till she had all of her questions answered. She just was eager to tell them what happened to her. And listen, should we be studying our Bibles and growing in the knowledge of God and training ourselves? Absolutely. As a training minister here, I'm all for that. Sign up for the Institute. Bible class is starting. Do that. But you don't have to wait till you finish all of that to go and tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. We can learn as we go. And some of the learning even happens while we go. Do you see yourself? Have you allowed your life to be laid bare before God in this way that he might take up residence with you, that he might be Messiah over all of your life and cleanse you? How might you know if you've had this kind of encounter with Jesus before, that this living water has uh, welled up in you and cleansed you from the inside out? A, good, a question to ask is, has it forced you back into town? Has it, has it caused you and, and forced you to push to where you just couldn't help but tell somebody of what he has done in your life? Because what comes from this woman's obedience is so beautiful. She returns to the town. She, well, she returns from the town with all of the people. The disciples have prepared a meal, likely with the stuff that they gathered in town. Maybe they recognize some of the people from the town. Surely some of the people from the town recognize them from earlier. They extend hospitality there. They sit down at the well. Jews, Samaritans break bread, drink water. They listen to Jesus teach. They're so captivated. They ask him to stay, and he does for a few days. And we get to see in this scene an embodied picture of Christ reconciling all things to himself. Jews, Samaritans, men, women, rich, poor, everything in between, gathered and receiving life and belonging at the feet of Jesus together. She goes from being alone at the well to belonging at the well with Jesus along with what will become the family of God. This woman's encounter with Jesus had her life exposed before her. She found him merciful and kind. She was eager to share, even to those who had rejected her, because Jesus loved and forgave her. She was able to love and forgive them, not because of all of the things that they did to make it right, but because of what Jesus did to make her right with God. Do you see yourself? Can you hear his voice? As we close, maybe there's a couple questions lingering in our brains. Maybe some of this is new for you, and you're wondering, do I really need that? Do I, do I need the thing that Jesus is offering? Maybe you're asking a different question. Maybe you, you know you need it, but you're asking, is it for me? Does he want to be Messiah over my whole life like he was for her? The answer to both of those questions is yes. We all need it, and it is for anyone who has ears to hear and who will respond to the call of his voice. Jesus wants to do for you what he did for her and what he's done for so many from that time going forward. He wants to be Messiah over your old life. Will you let him? Pray with me. 
God, thank you. I thank you that you are so kind that you meet us right where we are. She didn't have to make her way to Jerusalem. You met her right there in Samaria. You had to go to Samaria. That's your heart's posture towards those who are far from you. You're eager to extend your grace and your mercy and to administer your healing balm on every part of our lives if we would let you. God, I thank you that uh, the gospel that you came to proclaim is for everybody. It's for everybody. And it covers a multitude of sin and a multitude of shame and a multitude of guilt. Lord God, you, you are mighty enough to cleanse all of it by the power of your spirit because of your sacrifice on the cross. So Lord, would, would we just be willing to give you the access to allow you to do the hard work in our lives, Lord God, that we might receive from you the gift that no one can live without, but we all need. Help us to see ourselves, Lord. Help us to hear your voice. And will we be faithful to respond accordingly? It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.